So the world that we live in is truly complex. And, and that's what makes it both beautiful and uh, fascinating, but it can also make it frightening. Now, our lives bring us into contact with a seemingly endless stream of complex concepts, uh, 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 places, and situations. And with six billion, seven billion of us living in this kind of post-data age, that stream has turned into a torrent. It, it can be easy to feel lost. But perhaps it's not just a, uh, a kind of cognitive overload which is causing this kind of alienation. If it seems that our view of the world is becoming more opaque, well, perhaps it is. I'm arguing here for the creation of a new set of human-centered tools that are, enabled to, that are designed to enable us to interrogate complex systems in a native way. I think that uh, uh, games can be used to, uh, to, to enable us to pull apart complex systems, play with them, and approach them without fear. I think it's time we make complexity playable. Well, uh, I'm a game designer, and I, and I specialize in making games for the real world. And I've been a game designer for about 15 years. And from the start, I was interested in games that take place in the real world that you play together with other people. And I think, in part, I'm interested in this kind of game because I think it was easy for me to imagine that people will be able to take the lessons learned from games and apply them to their real lives if they were already playing away from screens and out here in the real world. So, uh, but the real world games are a new thing, and new things need a lot of experimentation and collaboration. So, um, back around 2008, I set up a thing called Ig Lab, the Interesting Games Lab, which is the world's first pervasive games testing lab. Quite a lot of world firsts. Um, the, but, the, but this, in particular, was a, a lab and a community uh, developing initiative, trying to, designed to bring lots of people together to, to try experimenting with this kind of form. And pretty quickly, it developed into a festival of real world games called Ig Fest. Um, uh, which I ran for about six years. And then, and then since then, I mean, I've made games that uh, included a broad variety of topics. Uh, these have included things like the hat game, which was a, uh, a GPS-enabled bowler hat. Uh, yeah, you may well laugh. But, the, but you could find the hat with your phone. Uh, you, you'd, you'd get a message, you could, you could follow the hat, and when you found the hat wearer, you would say, excuse me, I, I do believe you have my hat. And then they would have to take the hat off and give it to you, and then the world is chasing you. Hounded was a game that um, uh, asked you to follow your nose. So we laid out scent trails across the city, and you had to follow these scent trails across town while we simultaneously chased you with dogs. <laughs> Real dogs. Um, this is in New York. Um, the Tweeter was a kind of creepy, cute, carry around a social robot that <laughs> talked to you exclusively on Twitter and essentially just criticized you. But it would, it would, <laughs> it would, it would give you monster love points for how well you looked after it. Um, the Black Maze was the world's first uh, bioactive horror maze. And what this meant was we, you wore a bio-harness, and we sent you into our pitch black maze, and then gave you 1,000 beats of your own heart to escape the maze. <laughs> Two, uh, 2.8 hours later, the original citywide zombie chase game. See, I avoided both first. Now, Pretty soon we realized that we were able to kind of sneak the more kind of complicated subjects in on the back of, the, of these game stories. But um, there, was always, there was always something else going on there. For example, um, this game, 2.8 hours later, the, the challenge you were presented with was, can you survive a night in the zombie apocalypse? So that was like three miles of a city, and we saw this across the UK, uh, three miles of a city that was laden with zombies, and you had to run through. So that's the kind of primary objective. But this, your experience, it was different. You and your friends would turn up into the city, and you'd arrive as refugees, and you'd be met by a kind of city official, and they would, they would welcome you in, but then they'd ask for your supporting evidence for your claim for asylum, which, of course, you don't have. And they're giving you a little time to, to get your documentation together, which is impossible. And pretty soon, you find yourself being exploited by criminals as an illegal migrant worker, only to be busted by the police, thrown back out of the city, and, and on the run for your life from the zombies, the, uh, with the only uh, chance to find a, a place called asylum. So, all the while the game is busy chasing you with zombies, it's also busy turning you into an asylum seeker. Now, on the subject of complexity, some of you, I'm sure, are aware of the, uh, the problematic predictions uh, around the subject of peak oil. Well, we had our own version of this when we hit something called peak zombie. So, uh, <laughs> so yeah, so around 2016, I I'd set up a new business, Free Ice Cream, and I was, um, but, you know, well, but zombies, they were dead to me. And uh, they were... <laughs> The, um, so the, the new business service, I wanted to take all this stuff I'd learned making these games and try and ap uh, apply it in a more, kind of more direct way, in a way that you could have more, a greater impact on the world, and also to get the kind of complex subjects off the back seat and into the foreground. 
Um, and then, to, how did you do that? I don't know. But uh, then this, uh, I think this something surprising happened. Um, the ODI approached me, the ODI, the, the Overseas Development Institute, and they said, oh, we have this new event, and uh, we'd, we'd like to use playing games with it. And it's called the, uh, the Global Festival of Ideas for, for Sustainable Development, no short names here. And um, so, so, sure enough, we, we started working on this, and we developed this idea for a, a game that could be um, a kind of alternative interface to the, to the conference. Uh, we worked on this for a while, and as we worked on it, the, uh, it, the, the UN got involved, and they, um, they, they um, co-produced it with us. And uh, we ended up producing a game uh, that was all focused on the, uh, the UN's sustainable development goals. The problem with the goals, of course, is that they're, they're massively complex, hugely interconnected, and, and sometimes uh, contradictory. So we made a thing called 2030 Hive Mind. Now, the idea here, the, the real problem we were given is that people who work in this sector, they're, they're very good at what they do, but they, they're so focused on it that they can tend to become siloed. And they, they fail to see the, kind of, the opportunity for collaborations, even when they exist. So we wanted to make a game that would enable them to, to look at what they're doing and kind of zoom out and see the kind of ramifications of what they're doing in this broader picture, uh, to find new opportunities for collaboration and, and you'd be able to kind of develop new strategies with people. So to do this, we developed um, a kind of multi-platform game. There was, an, there was an app that you could use. There was a, a set of a, a interactive game tables you could gather around. Um, and of course, this being the modern era, um, we had our own fake news. And really, it was, it was kind of the, the success of working with, with partners like this on a game like this that enabled me to really understand how impactful play games and agency could be um, if we're dealing with these big, complex subjects. So this is the, this is the kind of the toolkit. And um, agency is key to all of this. Um, the, the key thing about agency is that you're immediately involved. It's, it's about, it's about starting with that involvement. And the core of this is that the, you know, the, the, the player is active. Players make choices, and those choices matter. You, and as a player, you don't receive information. You take it. And, and play can be anything. I mean, play is any kind of open-ended activity that you enter into voluntarily. It's, it should be fun. But I mean, play comes with this whole other set of uh, opportunities. Uh, play enables you to do it wrong on purpose just to see what happens. Play is a safe space for which you to kind of fail in. And we're all desperately needing opportunities to fail, because you, you can't learn unless you fail. And then games. Games are, the, games are the kind of heart of this, because games give you all of these tools. The, the core of this is that games have a, um, a goal. This is a kind of like a, a reason for engaging in the first place, something you're trying to do, something overarching you're trying to achieve. But then the games themselves are made of all these components. Games have aesthetics, they have stories, they have technologies, they have mechanics. And all of these things become compelling tools. So here's an approach. Let's take play games in agency and use them to, uh, to try and enable people to interact with complex systems in a, in a way that would be frightening otherwise. Let's use this system to, to enable people to look at complex systems and instead of just bulking, well, you can play with this. You can pull it apart and you can see what it does. Okay, so complexity. Now, lots of things in our lives are hard to understand, but the, the complex subjects I'm talking about here tend to have these three traits. Um, scale. So they're out of scale. And by that, I mean they're either too big or too small for us to understand. I mean, it's, uh, we don't have a frame of reference for understanding like the really large numbers or really big scales or small scales. So we need some way of looking at this. Intricacy. Well, complex systems are frequently made of multiple subsystems all vying for attention. And it's, it's the, the, um, the relationship between these uh, subsystems, which is in often cases the most important. That's where you get the you know, possibility of orienting a new kind of emerging behavior. But that's really complicated. <laughs> um, and unpredictability. Now, once you've got a system which has got so many parts um, interacting, they're all free to interact as they want to, then it's, it becomes very difficult to predict the future states of these systems. You have to do it in terms of kind of probabilities. But that's, that's really not satisfying. We really don't understand that. You don't really understand what that kind of a chance means. Complex systems. I'm not talking here about some, some mystical thing. I'm talking about things which we experience in our, our lives all the time. So here's a problem for you. Supper. Please consider the following problem. What should we have for dinner tonight? Should we have beef, fish, or tofu? When you're considering your answer, please consider 
the, uh, the food miles con um, uh, contained in each, the amount of water used to produce each, the CO2 produced by each, the amount of land used by each, the number of jobs produced by, uh, are sustained by the, the industries of each, the salt content, the fat content, the vitamin content, the, uh, of course, the cost of these things. I, I mean, answer, it's too complex. Let's have pasta instead. It's, uh, you can't really... You know. <laughs> The numbers involved are always out of scale. The, the intricacy is, is super high. You, like, how many different systems are involved there? How do they all relate to each other? And in the end, it's just unpredictable. You don't really know if I make this decision or that decision. What, what's going to happen? Okay, so we're in Exeter today. It would be remiss of me not to point out another prime example of a complex system. is the weather. As for scale, it wraps around the whole planet. As for intricacy, it's made of like, innumerable subsystems, all of which are uh, uh, connected in subtle ways and yet, it's famously hard to predict. <laughs> On the same kind of axis, let's look at like, the kind of tools. So for scale, I, we, we need calibration tools. If, you, I, if I give you a figure, you need some means to understand that. So you need some frame of reference. So a, a calibration tool will, take, uh, will ask you questions about yourself and then use those answers to create this missing frame of reference. Intricacy, well. You need a few things for this. So first of all, if systems have multiple parts, you need a way of looking at them. So you need a way of laying them all out in such a way that you can see them. And then you need to appreciate some, some means of appreciate the way they affect each other. This means you're going to have to be able to reconfigure them. So that these systems might, might be like maps, but maps that you can kind of dynamically reconfigure yourself. And then unpredictability. Well, we're pretty bad at probabilities. In fact, we're bad at statistics generally. We have no intuition for it. So we, we don't really a grasp what any of these statistics really mean. So we're going to need something which enables us to play with those and, again, give us some kind of calibrated experience of them. The other thing, of course, is that we have to get away from this idea of kind of linear progression. That not all things are immediately causal in that way. In fact, so many things in life are emergent and, I mean, you know, and as such don't really exist in the kind of sub-properties. So you really have to look at expecting the unexpected. And I want to talk to you about like, like the best things in life, you know, the, 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 all these things that are... Uh, these emerging properties. I'm, I'm talking here about like life, love, international banking crisis. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, so why now? Well, there have never been more of us. The problems we face have never been more pressing. And uh, but the, the, also we have these kind of opportunities. So, so but if we look at a problem like um, uh, climate change, perhaps the, the quintessential complexity of our times. It's a problem that encompasses everything from the food we eat to the weather to the future survival of, the, of life on this planet. So it's completely out of scale. We have no idea for the, no, no way of understanding the numbers involved. There are so many systems, so many sub-problems, all jostling for attention. Everything seems to need fixing first. And yeah, it's completely unpredictable. I mean, how, where are we going to go with this? But using this toolkit, we can start to pull it apart. And we can start to pull, the, pull it apart and understand these things in a kind of an intuitive way. So, my manifesto, let's create a new class of games that enable us, as individuals and as communities, to engage with the, the, the hitherto dauntingly complex. Now, these new tools should be social, in that they enable us to uh, find new ways of collaborating with each other. They should be personal, in that the, the frame of reference they use are, are created with us and not for us. And they should be fun. You know, hey, how are we going to be?